All right, well, hopefully you enjoyed learning about flow from the official first person who ever really defined flow and did all the original literature and research on flow. So if you've never seen him talk, hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, so what predicts our happiness levels? Um, it's a nature nurture interaction as everything in psychology, right? It's, you know, some people have a predisposition to be happier than other people, right? So that we have to acknowledge the nature component of it. Um, but also the environment that we find ourselves in can nurture our happiness or squelch our happiness. In twin studies, about 36% of happiness ratings are viewed as heritable. Uh, I just hit heritable and I watched this guy on YouTube trying to say that heritable, you know, studies of heritability are faulty and oh my gosh, his logic, I can't even tell you what he was trying to say. His logic was so wrong. <laughs> like, I don't even know where to start with how wrong this person was in interpreting what heritability scores mean. Um, so I will try to explain to you what they actually mean. If you find the person on YouTube, you know, maybe you'll see what I mean by it. it's like, he sounds almost logical, but almost every single example he gives and every attempt to explain it was just completely off target. Um, so he obviously doesn't know what heritability means. Um, so with twin states, okay, so what we do with twin states is we get some fraternal twins and we get some, sorry, I should probably define those for you. So we get some fraternal twins who are um, basically regular siblings. They were created from two eggs that were ovulated in the same cycle and both of them got fertilized and both of them got implanted. And so they grew together in the womb and were delivered at the same time. Um, in fraternal twins, they are always on their own placenta and they are always in their own amniotic sac. So within the uterus, they are in their separate environments. Um, their placement in the uterus might have an impact on how much nutrition they get, um, things like that. And so there can be very different experiences for the twins that are in um, different um, amniotic sacs and different placentas. And they if you are a fraternal twin, you are always in that context. So you share about 50% of your genes when you're a fraternal twin. And you, while you are in the womb at the same time, so you have a more similar experience because of that, right? It's not identical experience because you have these um, different inputs from your placentas and you are separated by your amniotic sacs. Um, the fact that you're born at the same time, though, as a fraternal twin, you tend to be referred to by the you know by the world as the twins and you're treated very similarly especially if you're the same sex um, you can have mixed sex pairs of fraternal twins um, usually when they do research like i'm describing they focus exclusively on the same sex fraternal twins to try and keep everything equal um, so typically we're going to be talking about girl girl pairs or boy boy pairs um, and they were you know born at the same time so they have the same birthday so they have like a lot of events that happen together um, a lot of times they just sort of get treated very similarly sometimes they're um, they're dressed the same way depending on families you know some families will dress the twins the same way um, depending on the school district they may have been placed in the same classrooms some school districts maybe not um, so they may because they are twins they may be treated very similarly is is the point but they only share 50 percent of their genes in common that's like regular siblings. So usually in a twin study, we'll have some fraternal twins. We'll usually have regular siblings who share about 50% of their genes in common. Again, we're gonna usually focus on same sex pairs of siblings. So we'll have you know sets of brothers, sets of sisters, um, but they're not twins, right? So they share about 50% of their genes in common. Um, they were born on different days. They are not necessarily swept along in the same you know, birthday, same like treated as a unit. So um, their nurture is a lot of times quite different, not to mention the fact that their environment was definitely different in the womb because they um, were there at different times. Um, so the experience, like if one of them was mom's first pregnancy, her body is reacting for the first time to all the hormones and all the things that are happening. Um, the second sibling has a different experience with that, right? Because now mom's body is primed, it's had an experience with this. And so they may be more different from the very beginning than twins who shared the womb, right? Who had a more similar experience. So fraternal twins, 50% of the genes in common, regular siblings, 50% of the genes in common, but environment less similar. 
And then finally, we have the identical twins, and they have 100% of their genes in common. They're created by a single egg that gets fertilized by a single sperm, and then it divides at some point during development. And so they are, in fact, identical. They're always the same sex, so that's why the other pairs have to be same sex, right? We're going to try and control everything, so we're going to only have same sex fraternal twins, same sex regular siblings, because the identical twins are always the same sex. Now with identical twins, one big difference about their experience in the womb from fraternals is that sometimes identical twins will share the same placenta and be in the same amniotic sac. There's different degrees of sharing that the twins might have. They might be in their own amniotic sacs and have their own placentas. Identical twins can be like that. Um, so they would have a uterine experience that's more similar to a fraternal twin. They might have one placenta and then be in their own amniotic sac. So like the nutrition and any toxins and things that are coming across the placenta would be the same for both of them, but then they're in their own amniotic sac, so they may not be experiencing the same um, you know, level of salinity in the, in the amniotic fluid and other kinds of things that might have an impact on their development. And then finally, they might be same placenta, same amniotic sac, where they can actually touch each other, they're in the same fluid, you know, like that's the most similar uterine experience that you can have, right? So we have a little variability about uterine experience in the, in the identical twins that we don't see in the fraternal twins. Anyway, so all of those things are to set you up to recognize that when we do twin studies, we expect that if something is mostly nature, it's mostly biological, that would include genetic, that would include early environmental experience, right? If it's mostly this kind of biology, we would expect the identical twins to be more similar than the fraternal twins who should be more similar than the regular siblings. And what we find is that's true with happiness, that fraternal twins um, and regular siblings tend to have reasonably similar um, amounts of happiness shared but less than identical twins do. Identical twins match on that characteristic much more frequently than fraternal twins or regular siblings. So that kind of implies that the, that the biology is the most important thing, not differences in nurture, right? Because you would expect fraternal twins to be more similar than regular siblings if it was about nurture. So long explanation, about 36% of happiness is thought to be due to biological factors. We call it heritability not because it comes down in the genes. That's one way, way that that person was wrong on YouTube. It's not assumed to be coming down on the genes. It's something that we can, um, what, we, what we mean by the word heritability is how much of the individual differences that we see between people are uh, uh, accountable to nature, which includes anything biological, and how much of it is due to something else, nurture. So we have distilled it down to it. I'm gonna just say about a third of your happiness is probably some combination of genes and prenatal environment that would be, bio, that's called congenital, biological um, environment. The rest of it, the other two thirds, is gonna come from how people treat you, interact with you, encourage you, reinforce you for your behaviors. So most of it's gonna be nurture, about 36% is probably nature. Um, we see some variation across cultures in levels of expressed happiness at least. Um, and we think it may have to do with variations in how groups value different kinds of traits or behaviors. Um, I have a friend who's Finnish and I had to double check with her something that I recently read. I might have read it in Paul Ekman's book, but I, I might have read it somewhere else um, where they were talking. No, I saw I actually I saw it on the Internet where somebody said that they were in uh, they they were in Sweden, which is right next door to Finland, and uh, that they had smiled at someone at the bus on the bus. And their Swedish friend was like, don't smile at strangers at the on the bus. What is wrong with you? But as an American, uh, the tourist was like, well, you smile at strangers to let them know that, you know, I'm not threatening. And um, but no, you'll look like a crazy person if you smile at people in Sweden on the bus, just like being friendly. And so I asked my Finnish friend, is that true? Is that how it is in Finland, too? And she said, yeah, you don't you don't smile 
like you don't if you you know how when you're out in public and you accidentally make eye contact with somebody a lot of times you'll smile like I wasn't staring at you <laughs> I was just I was just looking um we happened to meet, meet eyes I wasn't staring uh she said yeah you don't do that in Finland you just keep your flat affect and you know move your eyes you don't you don't smile um so you may outwardly appear happier in one culture than you might appear in another. That doesn't mean that the intent is bad. And Finland's a great example because while they may not smile at people on the bus, they are consistently rated as the highest level of happiness as a culture. So, you know, what we may perceive as outward signs of happiness here in the U.S. may not be great markers of how much happiness the, the person or the culture might actually be experiencing. Your own personal history, which is, of course, part of nurture, you know, your personal history may be how people reacted to you. Um, but I'm talking here about personal history, like there might be a specific experience or set of experiences that have sort of determined your happiness set point. And so everything else that you experience subsequently is sort of relative to that set point, that balance point that we talked about earlier, right? Where this is how, like, this is my resting amount of happiness. And it would take this to make me happier or this to make me less happy than base point, right? Um, and so there may have been things that have happened in a person's history that have set that set point higher or lower where it might take more to make them happy than another person who didn't have that particular experience or less to make them happy. Um, and so personal history can set you up for sort of the, this comparison um, throughout your life. So uh, this is all kind of important because there's always these comparisons being made between nations on well-being. Like individual happiness may influence the overall national well-being. And, um, you know, when you have a lot of unhappy people, that can have an impact on um, the economy and the sense of self that the culture has, those kinds of things. So um, around the world, we have attempted to make comparisons between nations on level of happiness or satisfaction or different things. So I want to introduce the World Happiness Report. It's been going on since 2012 is when they first started doing it. And um, we have this lead author, Hellowell, who who has been the one who's been analyzing the data and coming out with like this report that the data comes from the Gallup World Poll. Um, and they use three different measures to try and get at happiness. One is they ask the respondent to imagine their life, Im imagine life as a ladder. If you imagine that the top rung on the ladder is labeled 10 and it's it would represent the best life that you could possibly imagine. And then the bottom rung is labeled zero and it would be the worst life that you could possibly imagine. And you're supposed to rate where your life is on that ladder, um, indicating how satisfied they were with their lives. They're also supposed to talk about how happy they are with their lives as a whole using that same ladder, right? So you, um, how happy are you with the, with the situation in your life? Um, and they found that the, you know, general ladder, like, where are you? How satisfied are you and how happy are you do correlate with each other. So you perceiving yourself as a particular position on the ladder is going to impact how satisfied you are and then how happy you are um, and, and vice versa. All of them are, in, are, are all correlating with each other. So here's the Cantrill ladder, it's called. And this is just the raw rating um, of where they place on the ladder, you know, how awesome your life is compared to others. And so what you'll see is I tried to give you the little code to make it make more sense because they've got NA and ANZ. That's North America, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, they have the highest Cantrell ladder rating. Western Europe has the next highest. Um, Central and Eastern Europe is down lower. It's the teal green, but see how it's emerged above the other groups now. So now it's listed next. Um, the orange line is CIS, which is the Commonwealth of Independent States. And so I went ahead and grabbed that to show you what countries are involved in the Commonwealth of Independent States. That's the orange line. Um, the dotted greenish, tealish line is Southeast Asia. The dotted magenta line is Southeast Asia, just South Asia. So that's like India, um, Pakistan. Uh, the dotted blue line is East Asia. The yellow line is Latin American countries. 
the thin magenta line is the Middle East and North Africa, and the thin turquoise line is Sub-Saharan Africa. And so you can see very much, uh, you know, order going on. And, and some, what you're seeing is that some countries have made significant in increases in their happiness recently, like not countries, regions. Um, so like Central and Eastern Europe have made giant leaps in their happiness um, compared to where they were in 2006. So you can see some move movement and um, this last data came out in 2021. And so you're seeing that there's um, been some dips in like North America and, and Australia, New Zealand, and then Western Europe, you see a little bit of a dip in their happiness and that might be tied to the pandemic little dip there for um, South Asia, right? Like the, so we got to remember that was 2021 data. Um, but on the Cantrell ladder, we're seeing this basic pattern and then they break it out into like, how often do you experience positive affect? So using the same graph um, legend, you can look at this graph and see um, that North America and um, Australia and New Zealand have the highest level of positive affect followed by the Latin American countries in the positive affect measure. Um, then we have enjoyment. And then we have, how often do you laugh? Uh, the top group of laughing is the Southeast Asia. Interesting, right? Latin American countries next, and then followed by North America and Australia and New Zealand. And then um, how often do you learn or do something interesting? And so you see the, the order of the country. So there's there are additional questions that they ask as part of this um, Gallup poll that, that Hellowell analyzes for the World Happiness Report. All right. Um, now, they like to organize us by putting it all together. This is the average life evaluation data. And you'll see that Finland is on top, followed by Denmark, Iceland, Switzerland, Netherlands, Luxembourg, right? Sweden, Norway. Um, so basically Nordic, Luxembourg is right on the borderline of what might be considered Nordic. I, I think that might be just regular Europe. Um, then we've got Israel, New Zealand, Austria, Australia, Ireland, Germany, Canada, the United States, United Kingdom. And then rounding out the top 20, Czechia, Belgium, and France. So... But you'll notice, part of why I wanted to show you this graph is you'll notice those bars are not like super happy and then unhappy by the time you're at, you know, number 20. It's like teeny tiny gradations of difference in um, average life evaluation. Um, now, if you break it up into six different factors that can contribute to happiness, they're all using, um, they're all being compared at, at the baseline zero is this imaginary country called dystopia. And so if everything was the worst it could possibly be, you would be dyso dystopia, right? So that's the, <laughs> that's the baseline. Um, and then the six things that they thought were important was um, perceptions of corruption is the, is the magenta part. Um, generosity is, what would you call that, burnt orange. Um, yellow is freedom to make life changes. Um, citrus green is healthy life expectancy. Turquoise is life is social support, and then the blue is the GDP per capita. So, I mean, there's definitely, they're saying, you know, average, average life evaluation is in large part um, tied to the wealth of the nation and then, um, you know, how trustworthy the nation is, right? The, how much it seems like they are non-corrupt and how much freedom people have to make their own life cho choices and stuff like that. Um, so... I just thought it'd be fun to kind of break this down, let you see, you hear it every year. Oh, Finland's the happiest country again. And they don't really give you, and then the U.S. is 16th, you know, like this is bad. Um, but they don't really give you a lot of context about how similar the scores really are across these, you know, top 20 and what these scores even really mean. A lot of them have nothing to do per se with happiness, but as much as um, sort of how the social structure is or the governmental agencies are, right? So I just thought it would be important to kind of show you those things. All right. Let's go ahead and stop here and we will wrap up this module by talking a little bit about happier life and so on.